and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing Talagrand's inequality. What is Talagrand's inequality? Well, let us recall concentration inequalities. Last time we discussed and defined uh, the idea of Lipschitz. So we said let x be a random variable that depends on n independent trials, x1 up to xn. We say x is C Lipschitz if changing any xi changes x by at most c. So this idea that a random variable doesn't even have to be a sum uh, would be nice if changing one trial doesn't change it by too much. And then we had McDermott's inequality that said that if x is a random variable, depending again on n, n independent trials, and if it's c Lipschitz, then it's concentrated around its expectation. Namely, the probability that x minus this expectation in absolute value is greater than lambda is at most 2 to the e minus lambda squared over 2 c squared n. So we got this exponential concentration. So you'll note there if lambda is something on the order of you know, root n, then this would give decent bounds. And as it goes to linear, it gives even better bounds. And this is typically what we're looking for in concentration inequalities to be tightly concentrated. So that's what we had before, but there's kind of a question that remains is, can we replace the n in the denominator there by more like the expectation of x, right? So we wanted concentration to be coming from square root of the expectation on to even better bounds with linear. And that would work above if you knew the expectation was, was linear in n, which would be natural if, say, you were the sum of Bernoulli trials and your expectation was pn and p is viewed as some constant. But there are cases where maybe rx, the expectation is quite small compared to the number of trials. And then this bound won't say much at all. And so that is the question, can we try to do this? So for the instances where we need that concentration where the expectation is much smaller than n, can we hope to replace the n in the denominator with something like e of x? And the answer from today is yes, if we make an additional assumption. So this is what Talagrand's inequality will be about, is when, uh, under what circumstances, well, maybe exhaustive, but under a very natural circumstance where we can actually do this. So let's see what that circumstance is, what the definition is. So here we're going to let x be a non-negative random variable, so always greater than or equal to zero, uh, as in Markov's, and that depends on n independent trials, x1 up to xn. And here's the key definition. We say x is r -verif verifiable if whenever x is at least s, there exists a set i, subset of one, the set 1 up to n, of at most rs trials that, quote, verifies x is at least s. S. So we have a non-negative random variable, and you, the idea of our verifiability is somehow we can always point to a small set that verifies that indeed that x is at least s, that shows you why this variable is large. Now that might seem a bit abstract. More formally, if that's too vague, we'd say that for every outcome uh, omega with x of omega at least s, there would exist this index set i of omega, so it's allowed to depend on the omega, with i at most rs in size, such that for every omega prime that agrees with omega on the set i, that it has the same outcomes of those trials, then x of omega prime is at least s. So that's what we mean by they verify is they alone uh, keep x at least s. That if you change any of the other outcomes, it doesn't change that x is at least s. So this is quite natural if you think about, for example, coin flips, and if x was the number of heads that's non-negative, then I could just point to, to show that x is at least s, to show that I have at least s heads, I could just point to each head. I could be this head, that head, and so on, and that would be my index set. And then changing the other outcomes doesn't change that. It doesn't change that you've had these s heads. Now maybe you need more, so that's where the r comes in, so maybe I need additional uh, sets, additional trials there, but that's where we say uh, we're r verifiable. So not all variables are such verifiable, uh, but it is quite natural. And so that's our extra condition, and now we can tell you 
what's kind of known as the combinatorial Talagrand's inequality. So we'll get to the actual Talagrand's inequality, which is something from probability that looks nothing like this, but it has this implication of a combinatorial version. Namely, if we let x greater than or equal to zero be a random variable that depends on n independent trials, and if x is C Lipschitz and R verifiable. So now we upgrade from McDermott's and we add, in addition to C Lipschitz, this notion of being R verifiable, then we can indeed get concentration around the expectation. Namely, that the probability of x minus Ex is greater than t, that the distance is more than t, is at most 4 times e to the negative t squared over 8rc squared for e of x plus t. So you'll note there we've replaced the n on the bottom now with an e of x plus t, and that's again quite natural because you need the, you want the e of x there and you kind of need the t as t could be uh, quite large. And so you'll need it to be linear in the in the tails when t is much much larger than the expectation. And again r and c squared will mostly be viewed as uh, constants, and so this is quite a nice bound providing tight concentration. But there's a proviso there. So note the line then for every t, I'm assuming t is a bit large here, we need that t is at least 96 c squared of r expectation of x plus 128 r c squared. So we need a, a bit large of a t to apply this. So that seems, you know, quite natural there, uh, and indeed you won't really get much if you use somewhat smaller t, but we want to make, so we want to make sure of that. So I just made you aware of that by putting it in the uh, formula above, but this will tell you, you know, you can't expect maybe to concentrate closer than the square root of the expectation, but anything above that we will indeed uh, get quite good bounds, this exponential decay. So that's what Talagrand's affords us, this combinatorial Talagrand's. Uh, if we are Lipschitz, so changing doesn't change much, and we're R verifiable, you can verify a large number with a small set of trials, uh, then we get this tight concentration. So the goal of today is to prove this combinatorial Talagrand's and the actually the more general Talagrand's inequality from probability uh, and, and derive this combinatorial Talagrand's from it. Next time we'll look at actually applying Talagrand's and other concentration inequalities uh, to probabilistic problems. So on with the, the proof and the statement of Talagrand's uh, actual inequality. So to do that, let me set the setting. So for every i and n, we'll let omega i be a probability space and let omega be the product of these probability spaces, so with the product measure. Uh, so that's quite natural. So if we had n independent trials, that's exactly what this would have as a probability space. We take their product. And now let A be a subset of omega, so a subset of the outcomes. Uh, so you can think of that as an event, and then let X and Y uh, be in omega. So there are potential outcomes there. And then here's the nice notions. We define the Hamming distance between X and Y, uh, which we'll denote DXY, as the number of indices where their outcomes differ. So where XI is not equal to YI. And these are not necessarily coin flips. There might be more than one outcome, uh, but just saying that they don't get the same outcome on that trial. So that's quite a natural notion, the Hamming distance between two outcomes. And now we extend that more generally to, for a vector a in Rn, uh, the a-weighted Hamming distance. So you could have kind of weights to the, to the different trials, and so the weighted Hamming distance would be the sum of these ai's where they actually differ. So then using that notion, uh, we can now uh, also define the Hamming distance between uh, a vector and a set. So there you would take uh, the infimum, somewhat the min if you think it was uh, finite, uh, for y and a of the distance, but here we would also do it in the weighted version, so with a weighted. So that's all quite natural. So we're, since we're in this product space, the idea is to use Hamming distances and weighted Hamming distances instead of more geometric notions like Euclidean norms. And now uh, we can proceed with getting to Talagrand's inequality. So now here's the key definition. I'll call it the Talagrand distance uh, between X and A. And so what is that? It's going to use this weighted Hamming distance, but I'm going to denote it rho AX as the supremum over all unit vectors uh, 
a in R n, so where the U, that's the Euclidean norm, the, the L2 norm is one. So think of that as picking a direction. So we take that and we take the distance from, from x to a. So you can view this Talagrand distance then as somehow you take the maximum over all possible you know, directions uh, of the, dist the weighted dist the Hamming distance from x to a in that direction. All right, so you might not have a good intuition of that yet, but let's just work with that as our, our key definition. And then we need one more, is that for any real t at least zero, we'll define a t to be uh, the outcomes x and omega, where the distance from x to a in this telegram distance is at most t. So somehow you could think of it as a ball. Again, that's not the right intuition with geometry, uh, as it's not from some geometric norm, but a t would be the things within distance t of a. And now given all that setup, here is Talagrand's inequality from 1996. So Talagrand really launched a whole manuscript with all different kinds of nice inequalities and applications. Here is kind of the key inequality coming from this Talagrand distance, which actually has a rather short proof uh, that will do. So it's a bit technical and complicated, but it's quite nice. So what is the inequality? It says that the probability of a times the probability of the complement of a t is at most e to the minus t squared over four. So what is that saying? Either a has to have small probability or the things far away from a, so at least t away from a have to have small probability. So in particular, if the probability of a was at least a half, if you knew that a uh, was somehow a, a decent proportion, I could even take a tenth or so, but if you knew that A was somehow a decent proportion of the overall probability space, then the probability to not be within telegram distance T would decay exponentially. As you just have a half factor, you'd put that on the other side, make it a two. So this would give you kind of exponential decay. So it, it's quite a nice statement. It, it somehow makes sense that things have to be close, uh, have to somehow be close if there are large uh, fraction of the overall space. So that's what we're going to try to prove, uh, this Talagrand's inequality. Uh, how are we going to do this? Well, so again, later we'll, we'll de derive the combinatorial version from this, but let's try to prove Talagrand's. So how do we do this? We'll need an alternate formulation of the Talagrand distance. So that might be a little hard to think of. It's somehow the maximum overall directions of your this weighted Hamming distance from that direction. A better way to think of it is to find uh, UAX to be the upward closure of the following set. So it looks like a mouthful, but it's not. It says, take all zero one vectors in N, uh, where we have the property that you took some Y and A, and you put an S, you put a one on that vector, if and only if XI is not equal uh, to YI. So you write down for every Y and A, uh, kind of a Hamming distance vector. You write down a one if, they, if it differs from x in that coordinate. And then you upward close this. So then you allow ones wherever there are zeros, but not vice versa. So we allow any vector where, the, the only requirement though is that there's some y where the zeros uh, agree. It's a different way to say it, but this may be more natural. So that will give you different points of this, this hypercube, the different vertices, because they're zero, one, uh, and dimensional vectors there. And now what we'll do is we'll actually pass to the convex whole of that vector. So you have vectors, your vertices, the cube, we'll take all convex combinations of them to actually get uh, kind of a connected set there. And we'll call that VAX. And now that you understand that, we'll, do, we'll actually can write a little bit better that this Talacran distance is actually equal to will be the supremum overall directions, A, but where you take the infimum of these coordinate points of the dot product A dot S, right? So we only were interested in these weighted Hamming distances. So somehow we don't care at all what the variable is. We just care about these Hamming vectors. So you could throw out essentially all the information uh, from the probability space and, and kind of just look at it as this problem on the hypercube. And then what we'd be interested in are these, these dot products, these sum of the AI where they differ. So it'd be 
precisely this definition is the supremum over all directions a and what is that a dot s that's the projection in that direction so it would be the minimum projection over all of these Hamming vectors uh, in that direction so that's the um, definition that's a different way to say it and now once you see that you can actually come up with a very nice lemma so here's the nice lemma it says that telegram distance this row ax is actually equal to the minimum of the vectors in this convex hole this vax of their norm their the norm of v so what does that mean so you can think of it as the supremum in all directions of this minimum projection, but I actually claim it's the minimum norm of this convex hull of those Hamming vectors. And so why is this proof? Essentially, geometry. So we could do it out, but I'll maybe just try to explain the geometric intuition. So one thing is basically you can't do better uh, than V. So V really, if you go in the direction of V, if you pick uh, that to be your direction, that to be your unit vector, uh, then you'll realize that since it's the closest one of everything on that convex hull uh, to the origin, then it actually, that would be the minimum projection in that direction. So you can't really do better, but you can always do it most v. So why is that? In any direction you go, well, we know that we always have we always know that actually then V projected in that direction is at most its norm. And so it's always, uh, the, its projection is always at most that. Now it's not one of the vertices, it may be inside, but since it's always has at most that projection, that means it's a convex combination of other, of the actual unit vector, of the actual integral vectors, the vertices of our hypercube. And so at least one of them has to have an equally small projection. And then that would be the proof. So I could write out the details. I thought I'd skip it. You could try to imagine uh, geometrically how those statements work, that you can't really do better, uh, but it's always at most. So this is actually a nicer way to think about telegram distance and gives it a lot of its richness, that somehow uh, if you look at these Hamming vectors, the telegram distance could have equally been defined as this minimum norm in the convex hole of those, uh, somewhat those Hamming difference vectors. All right, now given that, we can tell you what Talegrand's real inequality is. So we'll derive Talegrand's from it, but here's the real inequality, is that if we integrate over the probability space omega e to the row of ax squared, so the distance uh, from x to a, divide by 4, so you take this integral over these dx, these vectors, the claim is that that's at most 1 over the probability of a. It's at most uh, the reciprocal. So as the so somehow we give an upper bound on this, this integral, this, this squared integral there, this exponential squared. Uh, and so, so why is that? Uh, well, we'll get to the proof, it's very slick, but somehow so we're taking this, it should remind you of the Chernoff method and things, we're somehow taking an exponential moment. We're doing it as an integral, but really that's somehow we're finding this, this, um, this, this sum, right? This expectation uh, of this square and so our claim then is it's, it's going to be upper bounded by one over the probability of A. So somehow if the probability of A is large, uh, is quite large, then this right hand side would be quite small. And it's saying actually then things can't be on average, by average in this exponential sense, too far uh, from our, our um, set A. And so this actually then maybe gives you a sense of how telegrams uh, this implies Talegrand's inequality via the Chernev method. So namely, you would let x be a random variable, which is the distance uh, from little x to a. And then what is the probability that I'm at least distance t, that I'm in a t bar there, the complement? Well, that's the probability that x is at least t, because x is non-negative there, it's a, it's a distance. Which then with this Chernoff method, I can pass to this exponential uh, moment instead. So I could look at that's equal to the probability that ex squared over 4 is at least et squared over 4. And that's at most by Markov's the expectation of ex squared over 4 uh, divided by et squared over 4. And now the point is the expectation is precisely that integral above. And so the last term by the theorem above the last term is at most 1 over the probability of a times e to the minus t squared over 4. And so you can rearrange and find that either probability a 
or probability of AT bar must be small. And that was the Talagrand's inequality. So it makes sense once we know this, this expectation bound, uh, then we can use our standard tricks with Markov and such uh, and Chernoff to actually say, oh, okay, then we get this e to the minus t squared over four bound. So that's quite nice as it dovetails with what we did before with uh, Zumas and Chernoff, it's Hoftings, et cetera. Uh, it's giving us a kind of a better way to find this exponential expectation, but here we're using uh, the square of the distance there, which is presumably quite natural. All right, so that's how we get Talagrand's inequality uh, from this exponential inequality. Now I have to prove to you that exponential inequality. So how are we gonna do that? Well, the proof will go by induction on n. So we're gonna look at the n equal one case and the n at least two. And so I'll just remark now, this is actually quite striking. Uh, so we have to prove this, this inequality uh, and it involves integrals and such uh, on some product space and the dimensions n, but it, the proof reminds you a lot of the proof we did of the four functions theorem. So we have some induction on the dimension n, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look specially at the n equal one case and say, oh, in this case, we can just do some arithmetic. Here that arithmetic would be calculus and conclude the answer. And then more generally for then at least two case, we'll do our, our method from before of breaking it down to smaller dimensions and using induction. So let's see how this works in practice. So the n equal one case. Well, for n equal one, what could this, this Hamming distance be? Uh, there's only really one variable, so there's only really two unit vectors, so really this distance can be one if they differ, so if x is not an a, uh, and zero if x is an a. So a is just a set of possible options, and x is either in that set of, of possible outcomes or not, so it's either one or zero. So it's a very simple case to understand, and hence this integral is easy to calculate, namely we can upper bound it with it's the if probability of a will get uh, a zero there, so we'll just get e to the zero, which is one, and then one minus probability of a time will get e to the one quarter. And so we get this, this upper bound there, and now you'd have to use some calculus to show that no matter what the probability of a is, so for any u between at least zero and, and most one, the calculus would show that u plus one minus u e to the quarter is at most one over u. So we won't do that, but exercise you can do it at home, but then we're done because setting u to be the probability of a, we'd find that this is indeed, this integral is at most one over the probability of a as desired. So the n equals one case, it, we can just pretty much write down what this Talagrand distance function is, it's quite simple, and use some calculus and prove the inequality. Uh, so that should remind you from the four functions theorem a bit when we use some clever arithmetic to end up proving the inequality there. For the n equal two case, now we have to split it. So what we'll do is we'll project and slice. So we'll let b be the projection of a to what I'll call omega prime, which is just using the first n minus one trials. So more formally, that would be that b will be x in omega prime, uh, where there exists some w in omega n, so there's some outcome of the nth trial where x w is in a. So you write down all the possible uh, outcomes of the first n minus one trial that will extend to something in A. So this would be uh, the, so A would be the extension, B would be uh, the projection then. So that's one, and then vice versa for any W in omega n, so for any outcome of the nth trial, we'll let A W be the slice of A living there. So what I mean is it'll be the X in omega prime where X W is in A. So somehow you can project A down and look at everything and that will give you B, or you can pick a particular value w and look at that slice of a from there. So what lives below that particular value of w, we'll call that aw. And this should be a bit reminiscent again of the four functions theorem where we did that. So we kind of projected all the pairs down. We projected out by the nth element uh, and we made um, kind of, we looked at that projection and then we looked at the individual somehow pairs themselves, kind of the slices. And so that's, what we're doing here. But here they're both uh, n minus one dimensional. So now here's the big claim to prove this n equals uh, n greater than equal to two case. And it's a bit mysterious, but just go with me, that for every lambda in zero one, we claim that rho of a xw, so xw 
is this pair squared. So we claim that this Telegram distance squared is at most one minus lambda squared plus lambda of rho a w x squared uh, plus one minus lambda rho b x squared. So somehow we can get this nice inequality uh, where we can get a distance from x to uh, the shadow, the slice a w, and also x to the projection. The squares show up and we somehow have these values of lambda. So let's prove this. We can do it for any lambda. Essentially the proof is as follows. The x can move to, to a in two different ways. So right, we have to calculate this, this distance from x uh, to a in this telegram distance and really you know, we did it using these, these Hamming difference vectors. So there's essentially two types then of, of these difference vectors where you change w or don't change w. And then what does that mean? That means we can break up these possible difference vectors. There's two options, kind of two main options as, as a subcase, that u of axw will always contain ubx1 and it will contain uawx0. So think about that, right? So if I move inside of my slice, anything in uawx, I can get to without having to change w, because that's a slice from w. Whereas anything in b, I know I can get there, but I may have to change w. So I'm going to have to add a 1 in potentially on the end there. Maybe I don't, but certainly if I add a 1, we're safe to get to anything. So there might be other ways where you, where you mix these, uh, but let's instead just work with, we know that we can get to anything in B if we change W and we can get to anything in AW if we don't change. So now we use that two facts to consider two different points in the convex holes. So we'll let S be in the convex hole, that V of BX, and we'll let T be in the convex hole of AWX. And then from before, well, we know we can get to, we can get to all the vertices of, you know, of UBX, uh, by adding a 1. So we can certainly get also to S1 as a convex combination. And similarly, we can get to the convex combination uh, of the VAW, the UAWX, uh, by adding a 0. So we can get to their convex combination. So the claim is then that S1, from, a, from before what we said, that S1 and T0 would be in the, this convex hole, uh, this V of AXW. And now, uh, since we're in a convex hole, so we had an option to get to S using 1s and W and T using zeros, then we can get the convex combination of them as well. So namely, we can get 1 minus lambda S plus lambda T, and you get a 1 minus lambda of 1 plus uh, lambda 0, so that's a 1 minus lambda in the second coordinate. And that would, too, be in the convex hole VAXW. So somehow this is the nice idea. In general, if there's somehow any point in the convex hole S there at any point T, we can get their convex combination as well, and the claim is that these two uh, provide a, a decent upper bound. Namely, now by convexity, we'd know that, uh, again, rho of AXW would have to be at most the minimum norm, so we could look at this convex whole vector we took and take its norm. But if you write that down, what that gives you, well, you get a 1 minus lambda squared for the last uh, the last coordinate, and then the other two are on n minus 1 smaller dimensional, so we'd be taking the norm of 1 minus lambda s plus lambda t and squaring it. But by convexity of norms there, actually that's, by basically Pythagorean's theorem, we know that that's 1 minus lambda squared uh, plus 1 minus lambda of s squared plus lambda t squared. And so we'd get that as as well. Uh, so we get that as an upper bound, and now the key is remember from the proposition that there would exist an S in the convex hole VBX, and there would exist a T in the convex hole VAWX, which actually meet the telegram distances, right? So there is some S whose norm is equal to rho of BX, and there is some T whose, rho is, uh, whose norm is equal to rho of AWX. And if you put that in the uh, inequality above, you get our claim, the desired inequality. So that completes the proof of the claim. Now that we have the claim, we can actually move forward with calculating these integrals. So namely, the first trick is let's fix w. So fix one outcome of that last trial, then substituting from the claim, uh, let's take its integral. So this isn't the full thing yet. We're gonna have to integrate over w, but let's take the integral of x of this row a 
xw squared over 4dx. And I've dropped the, the vector notations where because it gets a, a bit messy. And how would you calculate that? The point is from our claim, we know that the row squared there actually can be written as one minus lambda squared, uh, a lambda of rho awx squared and a one minus lambda of rho bx squared. So I can spread that out. I can take the one minus lambda squared over four, that's a constant, and I can move that exponent out front. And I can actually take the lambda and the one minus lambdas and somehow move them up and write them as a product and in the exponent. So you could look at the previous slide and then go through that and compute, but that's what you would indeed get using the claim and just uh, distributing it through the exponential. So we now know this integral is at most these terms, but what do I do with that? I have an integral where I have something that looks like I could use induction to the lambda and something that looks like I could use induction to one minus lambda. Unfortunately, uh, the integrals are not on the inside, right? So we'd like it if the integrals were on the inside, so use induction. And we can do that actually with something called Holder's inequality you might know from analysis. We'd apply it in specifically with p equal one over lambda and q being one over one minus lambda, which works because then one over p plus one over q is one. And what that tells us is this perfectly works out where actually uh, the term above is at most that constant e to the one minus lambda squared over four, but actually we can get that it's at most the integral of x of e rho a w x squared over four dx, that whole integral raised to the lambda and the integral, the same, the other one raised to the one minus lambda. So indeed you can flip those lambdas and one minus lambdas outside and break up the integral into two and product using Holder's inequality. And now why is that good? Well, now we can use induction, right? So this, this integral of X, well, by induction, you know, we're in the N minus one dimensional space. So that's the distance from AW. So we know by induction that that inner integral is at most one over the probability of AW. And similarly for the second one, it's at most one over the probability of B. And now that seems like we're pretty close that we just have to do some manipulation with these probability of AW and B. So the first manipulation is let's set R to be probability of AW over the probability of B. And then you could rewrite the above term to be, you could take out a one over probability of B factor, and then you'd have the, that E to the one minus lambda squared over four, and you'd have a divided by R to the lambda. And the important thing to know is that R is at most one. So why is that? You might want to stop and pause for a second and think about it. So what is B? B is the projection. It's all the possible, it's basically the union of all of the possible AWs, right? It's all the things that have live in some AW and an AW is one specific one, right? So if B is the union of all the AWs, then certainly has at least as large a probability. So R would be at most one. Now onward, now we have to optimize our lambda, right? So before we set out with our claim, we said you could pick any convex combination and Telegram in this paper says, you know, before you optimize lambda there, you actually somehow do this integral over the X uh, and then get down to this R and only then do we pick lambda once it's dependent on R. So it, it feels a bit like we do with turn off bounds of, of trying to optimize the, this choice of lambda, uh, but here we waited until somewhat the very end. And so I won't tell you how you get this. Basically, you just want to minimize that term e to the one minus lambda squared over four r minus lambda. So if you did a bit of calculus, it would turn out the correct choice would be one plus two ln r when r is between one and one over root e and zero otherwise when r is smaller. And a simple but tedious calculation, which I won't do, will then show that actually when you put in this, this kind of optimal lambda, that that relevant term, the e1 minus lambda squared over four over r to the lambda is always at most two minus r. So what does that mean? That means we've shown that the integral over x is at most one over the probability of b, uh, two minus probability aw over probability of b. That was our r there. So we've gotten this, but again, this is for a fixed w. So somehow for a fixed w, we can upper bound its contribution to the integral uh, via its projection, this b, and its slice, the aw. And now we have to integrate over all possible w, so all possible outcomes of that nth trial. So once we do that, we'll have the integral we desire. And what does that give? Well, 
the probability of B, the B does not depend on W, right? It's the projection of all of, of, of A. So the only thing that depends on W is AW, which is that slice. But then you can just see that actually, uh, then what ha ends up happening, well, we'd be less than or equal to minus uh, the probability of A there, right? So maybe the different uh, AWs can you know, overlap, but we'll, we'll, well, we're going to calculate them for each W, right? So then um, we'll end up with the probability of, of A. So that, so if you integrate probability AW over all the Ws, you just get the probability of A. You end up counting exactly uh, the outcomes there. And so now we're almost done because we want to get rid of the B now. So we rewrite this as equal to one over the probability of A of X to minus X where x naturally will be the probability of a over the probability of b, right? So that's what we did. So we end up getting a factor of x to move that probability b to probability a in the denominator, and naturally this 2 minus x. And now here's the important thing to note is that x is in 0, 1. So why is this coming from the probability space, right? So b is the, the projection, so we counted in b whether or not all of the w's, just as long as at least one of the possible w's uh, led to that point. And so what that means is that you're, you're actually somewhat overcounting. So the probability of b has to be at larger, at least as large as the probability of a. So x would be in 0, 1. So hopefully that makes some sense that somehow the, the, they'd be equal if you actually knew uh, every, for every point in the projection, all of its extensions were there but maybe that's not the case. So now we can just use, you know, elementary, you know, calculus or, or arithmetic or such to say that x2 minus x uh, is indeed always at most one, really for all x between zero and two, but certainly for x between zero and one, and so the desired inequality follows. So we get rid of that and we get, we're at most one over the probability of a. So that concludes the proof of Talegrand's real inequality this exponential one, from which we derived Talegrand's inequality, which was quite nice. And again, the ideas behind the proof to use induction on the dimension, n equal one case being easy, and at least two, we fix a particular outcome of the trial and we look use its projections and its slices uh, to get some bound on that integral, uh, and then we uh, integrate over all w and again, use some more arithmetic tricks. So we've used a lot of arithmetic tricks, various calculus. We optimized our lambda. We used convexity in the middle uh, to produce some claim that related those. So we, we did all of that uh, and finished up the proof of telegrams. So now in what time remains, I'd like to talk about how you would derive this combinatorial telegrams. So telegrams is quite strong and implies many things. It implies uh, McDermott's inequality, uh, it, it's quite strong, the, the actual probabilistic one, uh, and implies generalization with combinatorial telegrams. But let's just start with how to get combinatorial telegrams. So the key idea is the median. So we define the median of a random variable x, denoted med of x, as the minimum real number m, such that the probability x is at most m is at least a half. You, so you find that midpoint uh, where you end up going to at least a half. And you could do that in different ways. You could take the minimum such point, the maximum, the average such point, I'll just use min, it doesn't really matter for applications. So let's call that the median. And we can prove via telegrams that a C Lipschitz R verifiable non-negative random variable is concentrated around its median as follows. So let X non-negative be a random variable that depends on N independent trials. If X is C Lipschitz and R verifiable, I claim that for every T greater than zero, so no restriction on T here, and the probability that x meet x is greater than t, that you're at least t distance away from the median, is at most this kind of exponential. So we'll have a 4 e to the minus t squared over 4 rc squared meet x plus t. So that looks a lot like what we're trying to prove in combinatorial telegrams, except instead of expectation, we have median, and there's no assumption on the t. All right, so how are we going to do this? So that's the idea, is it's more natural to use median. And so I'll just... First, prove the upper tail case, so where the probability x is greater than mead x plus t, and show that it's at most half of what we want, so most 2 e to the minus t squared over 4 r, square, r c squared mead x plus t. And to do this, we use telegrams, so we have to talk about sets. So I define a set A, which will be all the things that are below the median, so it'll be all the outcomes 
where x of w is below the median of x, and b, all the ones where it's above the median of x plus t. And then the claim is that for every w and b, uh, the Telegram distance rho aw is at least t over c square root r med x plus t. So somehow the idea is a is be everything below the median, so it has a probability a half, and I want to claim that the things that are above have far telegram distance from everything below. And then it'll follow from telegrams that that just can't be uh, very much probability at all, and that's how we'll prove it. So first let's prove that distance. So why is the telegram distance uh, so far? So namely, what do we do? Well, let S be R of med x plus t. And then what we know is, um, sorry, that's a typo. It should be S be uh, med x plus t. Since x is R verifiable, there exists an I subset of N where I is at most RS that verifies that indeed X is at least as large as S. So there is a small set, an RS set, that verifies that x is at least the median of x plus t. So for our, our outcome b, we have this verifying set of trials. And now we're almost there. We have to pick a unit vector, right? So to show we have large telegram distance, we have to show that there's a direction in which everything inside the set A is far. And so we consider the unit vector A defined as follows. You take uh, the ones vector where you only put ones if you're in the, the set i. So for every trial that we're using as a verification, we'll, we'll think of the ones vector with that support, and we'll divide by the square root of i. And that's actually a, a unit vector you can work out. And now the point is that every w prime in a, so it is at most t in value, so you have to change those verifying coordinates. And each coordinate can only change at most c of value, so you have to change at least t over c of the coordinates of i, right? So these i verified them, you have to change them to get it to be smaller, you have to change at least t over c of them. And now we're basically done because that means that we have to change in that direction. So the Hamming distance in this direction would be t over c times one over root i, and then i is upper bounded by rs, so you get 1 over square root rs there as a lower bound, and so that is exactly what our claim was. And now we're essentially done, because we'll let q be this, this distance we had, this t over c square root r med x plus t, and by the claim we know that everything in, in b is at least distance q, so it's in the complement aq bar there, and now by telegrams we're essentially done as the probability of a times the probability of a q bar must be at most e minus q squared over four, which is e to the minus t squared over four r c squared uh, med x plus t. So everything gets squared there, and we get the four from telegrams. And now we're almost done. We know that probability of a was at least a half by definition of the median, since everything below the median. So you end up with a two on the other side, and now our inequality follows. And the proof is similar for the, the lower tail where x is at most, meet of x minus t, you just shift everything. You have a, uh, you know, you consider the set meet x minus t and the set b, and then the point is b will be at least a half in probability. Uh, but again, you can use the same uh, unit vector approach, and you only, add, maybe the number of trials is actually only smaller, since we're only having to verify that you're at least meet x, so we'd only have to have, an, instead of a med x plus t, you just get a med x, um, so that, which is then uh, even better. So we end up with two of these factors. So you have twos in front, so they get multiplied. You get a four in front for that factor. And then that concludes the proof for the median. And now we're basically done. Since x is then concentrated around the median, we can show that the expectation is close to the median. So here's the brilliant idea. It's natural, the expectation's hard to handle, probabilities with, but we can use this median idea to break the set into two and use telegrams on the two parts, the upper and the lower halves, uh, quite naturally. But so now we're concentrated around the median, but how do we know we're concentrated around the expectation? Well, if you're concentrated, then actually the expectation and the median must be close together. So that's what this theorem says, that if x is at least zero, is C Lipschitz and R verifiable, then the expectation of x minus meet of x is at most 48c square root rex plus
plus 64 rc squared. So they're within a square root of the expectation, and thus somewhat equivalently square root of the median of each other. And what's the proof idea of this is to bound the probabilities that x is in intervals far from the median using the previous theorem. So basically, once we know the previous theorem, we have these exponentially decreasing tails from the median, which will mean that essentially there's just not enough uh, probability far away. So you have to do some geometric series and sum those up, but basically there's just not enough as, as you tail off. So the expectation, most of the mass has to be concentrated within a square root of the median of the median. And then that means the expectation is there too. And that means the expectation of median are roughly the same. So actually they're within a square root of the expectation of each other. So I won't do out the math there as it gets a little bit tedious to track that geometric sum, uh, but it, it's rather straightforward once you see it and then you get that bound. And now you just put the two together because we know we're concentrated around the median, we know the median and expectation are close. So if you impose that condition that t was far from the median, so our condition before would lead to the requirement that t over two is at least, uh, t was at least twice the number above. So that t over two is at least the expectation of x minus the median of x. Uh, and so we'd actually know that we'd get pretty good uh, tails according to, so we'd be, to, so to be far from the expectation, you would be also far from the median and you'd apply the median theorem to get decrease. So we end up with this, this version of telegrams called, that I'm calling the combinatorial telegrams inequality, that again, if you're C Lipschitz, so changing the trial doesn't change much, and you add an R verifiable, then indeed we can get this concentration inequality where instead of the number of trials, we can get an expectation in the denominator instead with these constants r and c squared, 8, etc. And again, assuming t is respectable there. So that's combinatorial telegrams inequality. I will just mention there are actually even more useful generalizations of this that still follow from telegrams, probabilistic inequality. One is the weighted version. So you might remember with McDermott's, we had a weighted version where we allowed trial xi to change x by ci, and somehow we got a sum of ci squareds. That version also follows, and an even more version with, uh, from probabilistic telegrams, but also uh, we can change R verifiable. So how do you do that? Well, you, here's the change. For R verifiable, you instead require a set I of trials to verify X is at least S, such that the sum I in this index set I of the CI squareds is at most RC squared S. So before, all the Cs were the same, so you just get c squared times the number of trials, so that you retain the original one. Here, you could let them vary, and c would just be some constant that, that makes this work, and you recover the same. So if somehow you can find, if you can find um, verifying sets that are small with the sum of squares from these, these changing differences, we can still apply, uh, still get that version of telegrams. Another version that's quite nice uh, is called the exceptional outcomes version. In that, you allow a set of exceptional outcomes omega star such that the C Lipschitz property only holds for non-exceptional outcomes. So you might get cases where you think you're C Lipschitz, that most outcomes, if you change any trial, it doesn't change much. But then there are some bad outcomes, some exceptional outcomes, where actually you can't really say that, that some of the trials uh, change too much. But if you can say that they're very small probability, then you can end up kind of adding that probability in uh, and control and then controlling and going through the proof. So I won't go through that. Uh, it does require that you don't have it just for one trial, but changing a lot of trials changes it by most c times the number you changed. Uh, and crazy, you can combine these two. You can combine the weighted version and the exceptional outcomes uh, all into one and get this very general version uh, of combinatorial uh, telegrams. And similarly, you can also use telegrams probabilistically to, to forget about the, the verifying and somehow just to rederive uh, McDermott's and weighted version exceptional outcomes of, of those as well. Uh, but I won't get into that. I won't get into the proofs of these, but do know they're out there to look up if you do need them. So if you find, oh, I need a weighted version, if you find I need exceptional outcomes, you can get that and more. So we spent a lot of time today on telegrams because I really think this combinatorial telegrams is the most versatile of all the concentration inequalities. It, in, in the McDermott style, it does a lot. 
Uh, I've used it a lot in my own research above uh, Azumas or Hoftings or things, uh, as it's just uh, extremely useful for probabilistic combinatorics applications, and knowing it is, is quite nice. But again, it comes from this, this uh, somewhat scary probabilistic inequality, but that's quite natural the more you think about it. And whose proof has a very nice structure where you use these projections and these slices and go by induction on dimension, something we saw somewhat similar before with the four functions theorem, uh, but again, having to do specifics with the inequalities with calculus with the exponentials uh, to go ahead and prove it and derive and then derive combinatorial telegrams via means of the median. But we did all of that uh, today. Uh, next lecture we'll end up trying to apply telegrams and or the other concentration qualities uh, to some examples from probabilistic combinatorics. But until next time, see you then!